good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you here to the last meeting in January for the County Commission, and we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Documents are available for review down next to Commissioner Heiberger, and somebody back in the corner already reminded everybody to silence their cell phone, so I don't need to do that. Um, and Carol is here this morning if you need a listening device. And so with that, we um, will start with what I think a lot of you are here for. We have the pleasure of having the swearing-in ceremony this morning for the Minnehaha County State's Attorney, Crystal Johnson. Judge Robin Howman is here to administer the oath. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to administer the oath this morning to Crystal Johnson, who will be the new Minnehaha County State's Attorney. If you'd raise your hand and repeat after me. I, Crystal Johnson. I, Crystal Johnson. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of South Dakota. And the Constitution of the State of South Dakota. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge. All the duties of my said office. All the duties of my said office. Of Minnehaha County State's Attorney. Of Minnehaha County State's Attorney. Congratulations. Thank you. You're done signing all your official paperwork. If you want to make a couple of comments, that would be great. Thank you. I think you. there are two copies of that document. If you guys, if you could sign both of them, that would be great. Thank you. <coughs> and I'm going to apologize from the beginning. CityLink is apparently down today, so all the people who are tuning in that wanted to see you live and in person are just going to listen to your beautiful voice. And <laughs> that's <not> that's <laughs> probably better anyway. <laughs> So first off, I just want to thank uh, Judge Howman and the Commission for the honor of serving in this appointment. Um, it is uh, greatly accepted and greatly received by me. I also want to thank my family and friends who have supported me uh, in my probably kind of wavy career path. <laughs> I also want to thank Judge Long, who five years ago gave me the appointment to the magistrate bench. I think most attorneys want to be judges when they're growing up and um, when they become lawyers. And that's what I thought I wanted to do too. But I wasn't on the bench for very long before I realized that's not really where my passion was. My passion was being a prosecutor. And as a prosecutor, I get to be an advocate for children who have the very worst things happen to them. I get to be an advocate for women who have been beaten and raped. And I get to be an advocate for family members who've lost loved ones in violent crime. Being a judge is prestigious, but I found being a prosecutor just much more rewarding than any of that was. And so when I came back to the state's attorney's office, I said this before, I felt like I was coming home. I truly am where I belong. I enjoy my job of being a prosecutor. I do my very best work there. I feel like I, I enjoy getting to wear the hat of justice when I go into court. I enjoy representing my neighbors and my community when I go into court. And I like working with and leading a strong and talented group of lawyers and staff who work every day with extraordinary law enforcement and our court system to make our community safer. It's no secret that our office has struggled in the last few months. But just in the last several weeks, if you would ask anybody who has seen a member of the state's attorney's office, if you would ask anybody in the office itself, any member of law enforcement, any member of the courthouse staff, even defense attorneys, and they would tell you that we've turned the page. We are excited and we're invigorated about the work we get to do together we are a team, and we're excited about working together and turning that page that we've been able to do. We're on track, and we get to work as a team with our law enforcement and our community to keep this community safe, which is what our goal is. And so I've said before, and I'll say it again, that working at the state's attorney's office is very hard on a good day, but our office truly has a great future, and I'm really excited and honored to be their leader. Thank you. both for being with us this morning. It's an honor to be part of the process. So we'll 
We'll get your documents notarized and we'll get them back to you. You'll, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you for everyone who came this morning to support um, Crystal in her new role. She'll need all of your support in the days ahead. She has accepted a very difficult job, so we appreciate it. Thank you. I think she cleared the room. Excuse me? I think she cleared the room. Yeah. <laughs> the second to go to their next place of business. Okay, that takes us to regular routine business. Uh, the first item is I'd consider a motion to amend the agenda to correct the bills to be paid total from $580,542.73 to $580,543.73. I'll make that $1 uh, motion. Thank you. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Next, I'd consider a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Motion to approve the ad amended agenda. Second. second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Takes us to item two to approve the commission meeting minutes from January 21st, 2020. Motion to approve. Thank you. Second. Sometimes I have to hold you back and sometimes I have to <laughs> encourage you guys on. Okay, I got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? All right, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item are bills to be paid in the amount of $580,543.73. Pay the bills. Second. Motion and a second. Any comments? No. Commissioner Barth. A couple of bills today. <clears throat> we have 25000 going to the Garrison Fire Department, uh, or ambulance, I'm sorry. And then we also have uh, 26000 going to uh, forensics with uh, Dr. Snell's group. And uh, we also have uh, 19 occurrences of outside attorneys getting more than $1,000 for one case or another. Uh, looks like a lot of ANN and stuff like that, but 19 separate. Uh, I think I saw one for 4000 or two for $4,000. And so that adds up. Yes, it continues to be a struggle to try to control those outside legal costs. I appreciate you highlighting some of our bills because I think it's always, for me, it's always really instructive to look through those bills and, and amazing to see the breadth of the types of um, services that the county provides and that we taxpayers pay for. So thank you. Anything else? So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> motion passes unanimously. Next item, um, we'll start with reports that we have the Auditor's Office financial report for December 2019. Good morning, Vicki. Good morning, Commissioners. Vicki Hewitt from the Auditor's Office here with the December financials. Um, starting off with the general fund cash balance, ending the year at $15,641,084. Um, and on to the highway fund cash balance um, with $9,725,508. Um, expenditures um, for December, total expenditures, 56.6 million, 97.3% of budget, um, with the personnel portion of that being at 38,536,000, and the other expenses at 18,144,792. So all um, still within budget. The general fund revenue, total revenue, 57,495,000, 101 um, percent of budget. Um, taxes year to date, 42,674,000, and other revenues at 14,821,000. So we will have additional expenses and revenue accruals um, for December um, for that 13 period that we'll be bringing forward with the gen January results. Um, cash balances should stay relatively the same other than some interest that would post, so. Okay, any questions for Vicki? So you anticipate when you're back with the 13th month, the final closeout for 2019 that will be relatively similar to where we are in cash? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you very yep. much. All right. Uh, next item, we have um, the Minnehaha County Regional Juvenile uh, Detention Facility Report. I'd come in for your review. Um, we've got both the December and the fourth quarter report. And then we have the Sioux Empire Fair Association Audit Report for 
as of December 2017 and 18. That takes us to personnel actions. I'd consider a motion to approve routine personnel actions. Motion to approve routine action. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next item are abatements. There are none. Item seven, notices and requests. There are none. Item eight, planning and zoning notices. There are none. And item nine, com um, petition for compromise of lien. There are none. So that takes us to uh, public comment. If there's someone here today who wanted to speak, uh, this is your opportunity. Seeing no one rushing the podium. We'll go ahead and on to regular business. First item is an emergency management brief on the spring flood outlook. Good morning, Jason. This is uh, Jason Gearman, emergency management. Um, I obtained this PowerPoint from the National Weather Service. They've been giving us briefs uh, monthly, and then um, coming in the middle of February, we'll start getting maybe bi-monthly or more regular briefs as they can pin down on uh, what they think may happen uh, with the weather, uh, what's going to happen with the flooding. Uh, this first slide here is uh, calculated soil moisture. And as you can see, the dark green in the middle, that's where we're at. It's as high as it's ever been at this time of year, so they're predicting it at 100%. Um, next slide. And that's just another uh, slide that predicts our area through Minnesota. You can see we're all the, <coughs> we're not the only one that are in this type of situation. Now this one is the most, I can't read the, this is the Renner Aquifer. Uh, this, the, how high that in, in ground water level is, and as you can see the, the red line there, um, it's as high as it's ever been. Uh, it's three feet above normal right now, um, and I think it's one or two feet above what the highest previous was. And this is the uh, Big Sioux River near Del Rapids. You can see the, the blue, the dark blue peaks. Uh, and again, that's the highest river flows we've ever seen uh, for this time of year up by Del Rapids. Here's some snowpack or snow depth uh, throughout the area. Obviously, the, uh, the, bright, uh, the brighter purples, reds is the higher snowpack. Uh, we're sitting in a pretty good situation right now with the thawing we've had and the minimal amount of snow. And that's what we'd like to continue to see is the 30 degree temperatures during the day, freezing at night to give that snowpack, get that snowpack down in our area. So if, if we continue to see this, the outlook is better. Um, if we get some extremely cold temperatures and a bunch of snow, you know, obviously we're gonna have some concern about that. Uh, here's a similar, similar uh, slide for that. Here's kind of the national trend that's going on and you can see the, our area and how bad it is down through Nebraska and um, Minnesota. Uh, I believe this is some snowpack or frost depths. Uh, the frost depths are just depending on how thick the snow is or what the snowpack is. If there isn't much snowpack, obviously the frost depths are gonna be a lot uh, more severe, um, but it's not as bad as it was last year because we haven't had the long cold temperatures that we had. And this is the expectance of a flood. Um, so we're, we're in a moderate to severe uh, flooding prediction. Even if uh, we get normal precipitation during uh, the spring, we're probably gonna have some sort of flooding to deal with. Um, so we're up in that high to moderate area of, of the risk for flooding. And this is just a similar one. That was a uh, uh, vermilion. Um, so basically what we're doing is, I'm working with the city of Sioux Falls, we're doing some different things and trying to get sandbags prepared early. Uh, I put out a request for you guys to uh, assist with maybe a warehouse, a heated warehouse, and, uh, and uh, I got a couple phone calls immediately. So we're working through the legalities on that with the city to try and get the state pen to um, pre-make sandbags, 
put them in a heated warehouse until we can get them out where we need them. And as soon as it gets nice out where it's not going to freeze, we can start doing this outside. I don't know if you guys have any questions for me. Any questions? Madam Chair, I have a couple subjects. I'm, I'm sure. Like I, I figured we would have <laughs> questions from Commissioner Barr. Um, I wanted to ask about FEMA and where we're at with that. Uh, you know, there was talk about uh, uh, doing some work in Renner, uh, perhaps moving some structures. Is there any chance of that happening at this point? Well, I had some brief email discussion back and forth uh, about that. There was one request to do a home buyout. However, um, once you do that, uh, it's a 75, 25% match, whether the county matches it or you put that back on the homeowner. But then the um, county will own that land once it's done. So then you would be responsible for that lot if you were to move the house off or to buy it and destroy it. Um, FEMA does offer that program and it's still available. Uh, FEMA has closed down their, their DRC. Um, they've moved out. All the individual assistance has been taken care of. And um, some of the townships are still getting contact with FEMA from the September flood. Um, but overall, it's been a pretty positive experience this go around with FEMA from what I'm hearing from the townships. There was also talk about moving the fire station in Renner to the other side of 115. It's my understanding that that's been talked about for years, but. Um, so we just buy more sandbags. Unfortunately, that's the plan right now. Mitigation would be great to get that moved out of there, but finding the funding is difficult. And from my understanding, FEMA uh, will not build a new building. They won't build structures. Um, they will build help with mitigation. Unfortunately, the mitigation would be to move that somewhere else. Um, but I know the township has discussed it. Madam Chair. So uh, another subject, I guess, is uh, the flu. Are you staying in touch with the uh, feds on the, the the coronavirus uh, issue? Uh, we get updates from the, the South Dakota Health Network every day or every couple of days, and I know Sheriff Milstead um, has been uh, receiving those updates also. I had a conversation with him on, I believe it was last Friday, Thursday or Friday, uh, about it. And finally, Madam Chair, um, I went to the Fire Chief's uh, annual uh, dinner on Saturday night, and uh, uh, Jason had volunteered to set up the event, uh, <laughs> finding the location, arranging for the catering, and I think it uh, uh, went really well. And uh, Scott over there was in attendance also, along with the woman I live with, and uh, it, it was a good deal. Good. Thank you. Thank you for your work on that. It Thank was you. very nice to meet the other half of Commissioner Barth. <laughs> 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 Commissioner Heitkarski. <laughs> Uh, Jason, the uh, updates on the coronavirus, if those can be shared with us, could you? I'd be interested. I, it's, yeah, that'd be email. simple. I just forward you on what, what I'm getting. So, perfect. Yep. Anything else? All right, thank you for being here this morning. Right, thank thanks. you very much. Okay, that takes us to a brief presentation on the Glory House. Dave Johnson, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. <coughs> thank you for uh, allowing me to be here this morning. Um, I sent you just a brief outline as to some of the updates uh, regarding our our movement towards our uh, Glory House apartments. We're very happy that we actually opened the first uh, building uh, on December 23rd uh, and we had our first client move in. Uh, the excitement was pretty uh, uh, noticeable as he immediately took a picture of the apartment and his car that he had just bought and put it out on Facebook that says best Christmas ever. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's uh, uh, I think that's pretty uh, outstanding. Um, the apartments themselves right now uh, we actually have 12 people moved in uh, even though the brief says 10 we had a couple more and then we have another 15 to 20 applications in the process uh, for those folks to move in. Uh, there is quite a certification process involved with this uh, getting into the apartment. So uh, we've had uh, all sorts of help from Lloyd's Properties to help us make sure that we're in compliance with the, the, the HUD guidelines and everything else that we have to do. But I am predicting um, that we should be 
filled by the next 30 days. That's the way it looks. So it didn't take long. Uh, in terms of next uh, is uh, we are currently in our middle of our capital campaign. We're just over halfway in terms of money raise of the 1.35 million. Um, those uh, dollars are, we're looking at, uh, uh, we're not sure when we, we are going to break ground and where all the other funding pieces are gonna come from, but we're working with Lloyds to, uh, who are obviously the experts, um, uh, to help us uh, cobble that together and, um, and we'll move forward to the next 50 units. So, um, busy with other things. Uh, we're doing remodeling pieces in the treatment center itself. Uh, as of yesterday, we had uh, 92 clients total, both men and women. Um, and just kind of talking about our client base, uh, we don't have all the ni uh, 19 numbers in, but in 18, um, uh, we served uh, over 400 people within the treatment uh, center itself, and then we had another about 1,500 that was getting some sort of outpatient services, whether it be electronic monitoring, uh, uh, drug testing, outpatient treatment, uh, or whatever. Of our client base, uh, we had actually 145 different employers in Sioux Falls that actually employed our clients. And I, you know, uh, I have to give kudos to our business community that, that uh, are willing to give our men and women a chance because most of them just want an opportunity. So I think that's kind of important pieces. Um, we have about a $3 million budget. That stays kind of the, uh, pretty close to the same. We employ over 51 people. Um, and... Uh, uh, out of that $3 million budget, uh, about 65 to 70% are spent on wages, benefits, and taxes. So I'd be happy to answer any questions or comments. Questions for Dave? Madam Chair. Commissioner Barth. Um, <laughs> uh, Dave, you're such a low-key guy. I, you should be beating your chest and, and boasting about what your organization has accomplished. And obviously, non-governmental organizations do stuff which, without you, we would have to pay to have done. And I appreciate very much the Lloyd companies uh, doing the, the work that they do in our community to uh, help you, to help us with the, uh, the Safe Home and many other projects. Uh, you should be uh, trumpeting your accomplishments and, and your process. Why don't you outline briefly what you guys do? Well, th thank you, first of all. Um, my mom taught me to be humble, <laughs> and I listened. Um, not <laughs> always, but I listened to that. So I think, thank you for the opportunity. You know, um, we, we've been in the Sioux Falls community for a long time, 1968, Roger Fredrickson, had this vision. And uh, we have been, as part of the accreditation treatment fac facility uh, environment uh, since, that would it be 1990, okay? Uh, and uh, I came on board Glory House in 1987, which officially makes me older than dirt. <laughs> but um, I've seen a lot of growth, and we provide substance abuse counseling. Uh, we are accredited treatment facility. Uh, we provide services primarily to offenders, um, whether they're in lieu of going to prison or after they have completed a prison term or coming out of jail, where we help them transition back into the community. Um, we are used by uh, state parole and the court services to really help uh, solidify and try to give opportunity to those men and women that really are struggling. Uh, I don't have to tell you guys about the meth, mm -hmm. the opioid, uh, the alcohol-related deaths. All those things happen. And for our clients, um, 
uh, that is a lifestyle. And it takes a lot of work then to try to help them figure out a different lifestyle that includes not using meth, not um, uh, committing crime, about really standing up and, and holding on to the values of the community. You know, uh, be a good parent, go to work every day, stay away from the things that can harm yourself and others. So uh, besides the substance abuse treatment, our, our other largest component really is case management and employment. Our clients struggle with keeping jobs. In our environment in Sioux Falls, you can find a job. But our clients struggle at times, not all of them, with how do you deal with conflict on the job? You know, do you take a, throw a hammer at somebody because somebody says something to you or perhaps you figure out a different way to deal with it? Um, I would probably figure out a different way to deal with it. And that's what we're trying to teach our clients is this is the things that you need to do to be successful so you don't continue to use, you don't go back through the courts, you don't go back into the jails, you don't go back into the prisons, you provide support for your families. Over half of our, our clients have kids. You know, so it's really an important piece to keep them in the community and learn how to connect and, and be good parents. Um, and as we all know, <laughs> being a good parent is hard for, at least I should say, it has been for me, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think others struggle with that as well. Um, so we provide case management, we provide employment services, we provide the substance abuse counseling, we also provide uh, mental health counseling because it goes hand in hand. And uh, all these things work toward help people transition. Um, that was a long answer to a short question. Mayor Heiberger. I'd just say that was an excellent answer and I ditto what Commissioner Barr said because you are very humble in what you do and you do provide a wonderful service that we need. And so I'm excited to see the opening of more beds and the coming of, of even more, 50 more is amazing. So they're needed. And like you said, with the meth and the opioids and the alcohol that we deal with, we need to have places. People are looking for places to, to get treatment. And it's Thank a you. long process. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anything else? We appreciate you taking the time to be with us this right. morning and give us this update. Thank you very much. For Thank you for the work you do. Thank you for the support, too. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right. So that takes us to item 12, which is to consider bid results and award recommendations for Highway Project MC20-02 and authorize the chairperson to sign an agreement with Double H Paving for Mill and Asphalt Overlay. DJ, good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. DJ Boothy, Highway Superintendent. On January 8th, we received seven bids for our mill and annual mill and overlay project, and uh, we had pretty good bids uh, this year. Uh, the engineer's estimate was just over $3.1 million. Double H paving was $2,941,562.73. Uh, this is for resurfacing 15.9 miles of our county highway system. Most of it is east of, of Colton and southeast of Crooks. Uh, one thing that is a little bit unique, and I'll kind of piggyback off what Jason was talking about earlier with the flooding. Uh, typically, when we do a mill and overlay project, uh, we mill approximately three quarters of an inch of the existing asphalt, and we replace that with two inches of new asphalt as an overlay. Uh, this year, we're doing 3.7 miles of a two-inch mill and then a three-inch overlay, and that's because the pavement is, is much more deteriorated than, than typically uh, is the the typical deterioration on a mill and overlay project. Uh, that can happen from a number of things. Uh, one example of something that can cause this is when we have a high moisture content throughout the winter and into the spring, and we have freezing and refreezing and thawing out and refreezing, uh, and uh, uh, we're expecting a lot of that this, this coming spring because of the high moisture content in the soil, and so the freeze-thaw cycle is probably going to create a lot of problems with our road network uh, this spring. So just thought I would add that comment. Uh, but other than that, I can stand by for any questions. If you have questions on our mill and overlay bid award, otherwise I would uh, ask for your award and uh, signature on the contract for double H paving. Questions for DJ? Move approval. Second. Motion and a second. Anything else? 
Uh, roll call vote, please. Bar <coughs> Sorry, Barth? Aye. Heiberger? Aye. Karski? Aye. Bender? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. So that takes us to item 13, which is a brief presentation on the highway department. DJ. Commissioners, uh, uh, this is my 2020 highway department update. Uh, we had a pretty excellent year last year, and we're looking forward to another great year uh, this year. And so some, some big wins that we had in 2019, and, and I could probably talk up here for an hour or so, but uh, I think it but was- I told him he can't. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Bender <laughs> said maybe 10 minutes. And so uh, I'll try to knock through some of these. Uh, there's plenty of things that we did that, that I just don't have time to cover. And so um, uh, there's some things that we did list here that we thought were pretty great and, uh, and happy to share. So uh, Trish, if you wanna head to the next slide there. Uh, we had a major increase in employee morale. Really our employees are what drive the department and, and accomplish the majority of our work or, or work with people outside like contractors and, and other stakeholders that a complete work for us and so uh, this year for a combination of a lot of different reasons and efforts by a lot of different people we just had a huge increase in morale and uh, and that's really made a, us have a lot more success in the department uh, one of the things that we decided to try this year were ton, uh, turnkey plow truck bids rather than um, multiple different bid awards and and going through a process and 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 uh, trying to coordinate with multiple different vendors we we tried the turnkey truck plow bids and that's gonna save time and, and resources for us in-house. And uh, so far we went and did an inspection uh, down near Kansas City last week and looked at the trucks that are being built and, and it looks like they're, they're going great. They should be done here in the next couple weeks. Uh, an example of, of some of the uses that we've had for the resources that were freed up because we're not doing uh, these in-house and, and working with different vendors is uh, uh, about a month ago, James, one of our mechanics, saved the department over $2,500 in repairs by doing uh, intercooler replacement in-house. And then coincidentally, we had another intercooler go out last week, and he already knew how to do that, had, had basically done the same project a few weeks prior. And so uh, in total, he was able to save $5,000 over the last month uh, by doing those repairs in-house. And that really just goes back to having the time availability and the resources available to do that work. Uh, another great win that we had in 2019 was hiring some quality people. Uh, we had excellent service from HR in, in assisting in doing that, and, and we hired some great people that are, are already able to hit the ground running and, and be effective for our department. Our bridge inspections and bridge replacements, uh, we completed those with only one new uh, posted bridge this last year. Uh, right now we have 24 bridges that are posted for, uh, for reduced weight limit and four of those are in the construction phase, one of them is in the bidding phase. So uh, right now we're projecting by the end of this year to only have 19 posted bridges on our, highway, on our county system. And I think that right now we're at 196 bridges on our system. Uh, that number kind of fluctuates up and down depending on, on what roads are under construction or being closed or, or new bridges that are being built. Old bridges that are being turned into box culverts, there's a lot of different things that make that number fluctuate. But I think right now we're at 196, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let's see, County Highway 137 reconstruction. That was a six mile road reconstruction project that lasted two years. We completed that here uh, this fall, and that was a, a successful project. It turned out really well. The Northeast Area Transportation Study, that was something that was pretty new to us. Uh, we've done uh, long range transportation plans and worked with the MPO on different studies, but uh, in-house or, or just only our department. We've never really gone through that process before uh, where we look at a specific area and, and do a transportation study. So uh, we hired a consultant and, and went through the northeast area of the county and, and looked at a lot of different roadways. We received recommendations to uh, replace County Highway 103 north of Sherman here in the next budget cycle. We'll go through the long-range planning process and, and try to find a place for that to fit in. And then uh, we also see, receive several other recommendations to consider for long range planning, not necessarily in our five year plan, but more maybe 10 years or 15 years when we, uh, when our county continues to grow and, and the payment cycles change out there. One thing that's not listed here that, that, we, uh, that was a big win for us in 2019 was uh, bringing a state attorney on board out, out at the highway department, uh, just having her physical presence and being able to work uh, 
across the table from one another really uh, increase the effectiveness of, of working with the state's attorney's office. Next slide, Trish. Uh, some current projects that we're working on right now. We're, we've had several different agenda items for the County Highway 146 reconstruction project. Uh, that's 6.9 miles of, of reconstruction uh, south of Valley Springs from State Highway 11 to the Minnesota border. Uh, that's taken up a lot of our time during the planning process and the design process. Uh, we had a bid opening here a couple weeks ago. We'll, we should be considering a bid award recommendation next week. And so uh, we're excited to get that project uh, in the, into the construction phase and, and, uh, and start turning some dirt out there. The Maple Street, Park Street, which is southwest of Brandon, in between Brandon and Sioux Falls, uh, that project we went through a, a study phase last year and had recommendations come out of that. We entered into contract with a consultant for some preliminary design and we're hoping to move forward with a build grant application here in 2020. Uh, so that project is, is uh, out and running. And uh, we are currently working on County Highway 149 right of way. That's a, a road project that will be I think five and a half miles or so south of, of Colton. Uh, the extension of the County Highway 149 project that was completed a, a couple years ago north of Hartford. And so uh, most of that has less than 100 feet of right-of-way corridor right now and, and our team is working on acquiring the rest of that right-of-way so we can move forward with the project here in the next couple years. Well, an exciting thing for, for our guys and, and for our team is the facility replacement. It looks like it's going to be time for Highway Department to get a new facility here in the next couple years. We'll be moving in hopefully. And so uh, that's something that we're working on uh, coordinating here in 2020. And then social media engagement, uh, that's something that we made a priority at the beginning of 2019. Uh, we primarily use Facebook for our social media and just the outpouring of support that we've gotten with updates that we give for weather and construction and other things that we do has, has really been great. Trish, were you able to get that picture? Yeah. She's working on it, okay. I sent Trish a picture of something that we did here I just sent it a few minutes ago, so she might be able to pull it up. If not, um, I was just trying to show uh, the amount of support that we get on our social media account. It's, it's really been awesome. Uh, we'll post a picture or a video or something like that usually every morning when our snowplow trucks are out and, and try to describe and show what the weather conditions are like so people have an idea before they make their commute to work. And then uh, the amount of comments that we received, just people thanking our snowplow truck drivers or thanking them or thanking us for the update that we provide has really been awesome. And it's, we've really kind of nurtured a positive community there. And, and uh, we don't see that everywhere with different governments on social media. So that's been uh, pretty awesome to see. We also, a lot of our guys, maintenance guys, uh, they don't have Facebook or social media, so they don't see all those comments. And so we share on meetings every week at, some of the comments, but uh, Sarah printed out a whole bunch of uh, comments and posted them on a poster board and put it out by the time clock so everybody could see. And it was just kind of a neat way to show the, actually the amount of comments that we get. Uh, I think the video that we posted last week had something like 10,000 views within the first couple days. And then I don't know how many comments we ended up with, but I know the last time I had looked at it, I think it was over 60 comments. Just again, positive stuff. There might be a half dozen things that are negative, but they usually come from the same people. And, and when we follow up, we find out that they weren't really necessary comments. They were more just people being negative about things. Maybe if you just want to go to the next slide, that's okay. Uh, future opportunities. Uh, so every three years, we try to do uh, an analysis of our pavement to, to track the condition and the degradation of, of what our pavement does. And uh, so in 2020, we'll be doing that pavement analysis with IMS, the consultant that comes from Arizona. Uh, they'll drive their van on, on each, of one of, each one of our miles and, and, and use the information that they gather from the van to run an analysis on, on what kind of condition our pavements are in. So uh, we look forward to that in 2020. Uh, I would expect by the fall of 2020 or early winter, we'll have that report. Uh, the Sioux Falls MPO is going through the long range transportation plan process right now. And so we're heavily involved in that. And, and so that will be something that throughout this year, I'm sure the commission will hear more updates on. And uh, we look forward to the results of that transportation planning process. We have a lot of safety driven project selection 
uh, items that that we go through. Uh, I think the last safety driven project that I briefed the commission on was the installation of additional stop signs at intersections and no passing zone signs on the, the left hand side of the roadway uh, at the end of each no passing zone. And, uh, and safety is, is really our primary motivator for, uh, uh, for what we want to accomplish in our department. We want to make sure everybody has a safe way to and from work or to and from school. <coughs> and, and so I uh, wanted to point out the safety driven project selection process that we use and then asset sustainability. Uh, there's a there's a cheap way to get things done, and then there's a cheap way to maintain things, and, and a cheap way to uh, uh, to have a lower life cycle cost. And so, uh, we're looking at our assets and, and tracking our asset conditions, and trying to make smart decisions based off of long range planning and, and long range sustainability, not necessarily just trying to get the cheapest job done today. And it might cost a, a fraction more today than it than it would have if we chose a cheaper product. Uh, but long range life cycle costs really is is how we try to uh, make a lot of our decisions, not all of them, but a lot of them. And that comes from information that we get from uh, from asset management a lot of times. Next slide. That's all I have for for the updates. I can an try to answer any questions that anybody has about the highway department. Thank you. Questions, comments? Commissioner Barth. <laughs> DJ, I was uh, in uh, Colton last Wednesday night. It was very foggy, and uh, as I was driving back, uh, going on uh, towards Baltic, uh, I saw Highway 137, and I was sort of afraid to turn on it. But it's finished now, right? I could drive on it. 137 is 100% complete. Yes. Great. That's wonderful. Um, I do appreciate the fog line alongside the road because uh, I actually left early because I wasn't uh, felt like I was in the movie Fargo. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I, I want to change the subject slightly. Being out in the county and stuff, how are the township roads doing from your perspective? And is there a variance between, say, the northwest and the southeast, or? I think I know where you're getting maybe with that question. Uh, most of the township roads, I think, are, are drivable and passable. And there definitely are some that are in rough shape because of the flooding that we had. Uh, over the summer last year. I, I wouldn't say that any of the townships are negligent or anything like that. I mean, it's just they had, they had a lot of damage last year and a lot, of, a lot of areas were washed out. There's a couple spots that are still closed because they haven't gotten to the repairs yet or, or for whatever reason they haven't completed the repairs. Um, but in general, uh, overall throughout the county, I think that they're in pretty decent shape. I think that in 2020, there's still going to be a lot of graveling operations where they're putting down additional gravel that had washed out from last year, but there's the, most of the roads are still passable. Thanks. Commissioner Karski. DJ, I was your liaison for three years and just want to congratulate you on you know, morale, safety. That's all from management. I mean, really filters down from the top. So congratulations Thank you. on that and, and um, getting the right people. I know you've kind of restructured um, teams and within your organization so um, just good job in getting all that done I'm um, going to give you hope that you know we will replace your 70 plus year old facility before you retire so um, <laughs> yes yeah. <laughs> so keep keep optimistic there so congratulations appreciate that you got mm -hmm. a long way to 65 so we have a long <laughs> wait <laughs> Hiring soon. I'd like to have it done before I retire. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Commissioner Barth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody else want to talk about retiring? <laughs> Any other questions for DJ? Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for you. coming this morning. All right. So that takes us to item 14, which is to, cons to consider a motion to appoint Dean Karski to the Sioux Empire Triage Center Board. Carol, good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Carol Muller, Commission Office. Before you today, is a request to appoint Commissioner Karski to the Sioux Empire Triage Center Board. Um, we've been talking about triage for a long time, and we continue to make some, we continue to take steps towards this, and this is a significant step for us because that board is getting formalized at this particular point. Serving on that board will be um, a commissioner from Minneapolis County, the mayor, and the presidents of Sanford and Avira. And they're anxious to, uh, get their documents going because we'll start seeing some things coming back to us. So before you today is a request to appoint Commissioner Karski to Sioux Empire Triage Center Board. 
make a motion to approve with a comment. Second. And a second. Commissioner Heiberger. I'd just like to um, first thank Commissioner Karski for all the work he's put in. Um, it was a while back where um, we kind of divvied up some of the different jobs that were coming forward and everybody miss, um, like Jean took and, and Jeff were both on that on the jail and, and um, Dean was was put on triage and it's kind of been a, a quiet subject more so than the jail as it, but Dean has been out there working and meeting and I think he's did an excellent job of moving this project forward and I'm very happy to support him for this position on the board um, because I think he's really done a fabulous job and he will continue to um, make sure that this project goes forward. Anything else? If I could comment sure. real quick. Mm -hmm. when I, January 3rd, 2017, I believe it was, I was formally sworn in as a county commissioner and triage was one of the very first, it was one of the 14 different um, liaison and assignments that I was given and it, it's been a very enjoyable one and I appreciate the rest of the commission's support on this. Um, things don't move real quickly when you're trying to organize two government entities and two very large um, healthcare organizations to all come together to do one thing. It sounds very simple, open up a triage and, and get it done, but we want to do it right, and that's what we're doing. Um, we're taking it um, step by step. It's a process that we want to make sure that as long-term sustainability. Um, tomorrow we will have a formal board signing just to the organization of the group. So. Um, and from there, we can move things even um, further along. And, and the year 2020 should be the year we open the doors. So appreciate your support. All right. Well, thank you. So we have a motion and a second. So a roll call vote, please. Heiberger? Aye. Karski? Aye. Barth? Aye. Bender? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you again for your service on that. All right. That takes us to item 15, which is a legislative update a lot going on in pier this time of year good morning it is busy this is our third week i believe it is in uh pier that session's been up and running so uh craig dewey who would normally be doing this and actually wrote the updates for you is in pier this week i want to focus on one bill that uh, minnehaha county has provided a strong amount of leadership for and is in committee before i believe senator or, or commissioner heiberger is going up yet today and we'll be testifying on this particular bill this is senate bill 68 and uh it is before senate taxation tomorrow and it is scheduled for a hearing i believe it's the only thing on the agenda senate bill 68 provides counties with the option to levy a bed board or booze tax at the retail level much like municipalities can do counties may select from doing nothing to taxing any combination of a bed board or booze at the retail level I want to talk about the dedication of those dollars because that's very critical to what this is. Uh, the use for these funds raised are limited to cover protection costs, including costs for law enforcement, incarceration, judicial services, the rehabilitation of those convicted of crimes, and intervention services for persons needing substance abuse or mental health treatment and emergency medical services. We know that uh, criminal justice expenses are taking an increasingly larger proportion of county budgets, and this reduces the available funding for public support of rehabilitation services and even essential county services. Tight county budgets are being especially stressed due to weather-related road conditions. We are fortunate in Minnehaha County that we do not use general funds for roads for our highway department. I believe we are the only county in South Dakota that doesn't dedicate general funds towards that. Additional revenue from a um, bed board and booze tax may allow general fund money then that's currently being used in criminal justice to be reallocated to road expense. Um, we talk about this being local control and coming back to counties in order to do this. And uh, regional needs are best served by the people who live here and know what those um, needs are. And that's why you've seen Minneapolis County being a strong proponent of Senate Bill 68. Uh, the last thing that I would add on to this is that ambulance services are included in this. Uh, they struggle in much of South Dakota. Uh, we're fortunate here that uh, we have a metro community that is provided for non, that has ambulance services provided by for-profits. 
but the majority of South Dakota is served by local clinics, fire departments, and nonprofits largely staffed by volunteers. So before that is Senate Bill 68. We appreciate Commissioner Heiberger going up tomorrow to talk about it. I know that you guys have been active on that. I would just ask if there's any questions or comments that you have at this time before we talk about one additional bill. Questions or comments? Commissioner I would Heiberger. Just comment that um, it will be in front of the Senate Taxation Committee tomorrow and we have to pass it out of committee in order to go to the Senate floor. And I would encourage you to reach out to our representatives that sit on that board, which is uh, Senator Stalzer and Senator Otten from, from um, Lincoln County. There are also several other on that board, obviously, if you would reach out to them with, and encourage them. Um, Minneapolis County uses 25% opt-out money. Um, and, you know, we're doing okay, but how far is that going to go? And people are tired of having their property taxes going up. And this is an option for us to put into our toolbox. It doesn't mean we have to use it, but we could. And um, we're not asking the legislators to raise taxes. We're asking the legislators to give us permission to go back to our own communities to see how they feel about it. And so we're not asking them to raise taxes. We're asking for permission to ask our own people. Madam Chair, question for Commissioner Sir, Heiberger. Mm -hmm. Which committee is it again? Is it taxation? Senate taxation. Thank you. Anything else? Madam Chair? Yes. I would say that we're very lucky that uh, Commissioner Heiberger is able to go out to Pierre and represent us on this issue. She's certainly a force in the state's uh, County Commissioners Association. Thank you. Absolutely. And we really appreciate the work that um, the prime sponsors have done on that bill as well, Senator Steinhauer and Representative Reed. Yeah. Um, particularly Senator Steinhauer has really been a great partner in bringing this forward and we really appreciate all of his hard work so all right we can move on yes uh, the one bill that we have not talked about before but I was asked today to bring forward to you is Senate Bill 70 and that is the bill <coughs> that is known as driver's license exams in Spanish a few things that I would just point out about this that comes from the organizations which are numerous that are supporting this what the bill does is it provides the driver's exam application, the manual, and the written exam in Spanish. The skills test, the driving test, still remains in English. The cost of this is $15,500. South Dakota is one of six states that does not offer driver's license exams in any language but, but English. As South Dakota seeks to fill employer workforce needs, the state has welcomed legal immigrants who do not speak English as their first language. Uh, many of our Spanish immigrants can converse at a fourth grade level in English or better. <coughs> the challenge is that the driver's license exams are written at a higher level than that. And that is where it becomes the challenge that it's requiring a higher level of, of English. Roughly 4% of South Dakota residents live in homes that speak Spanish as a primary language. That's roughly 35,000 people in the state of South Dakota. And as we all know and appreciate, mobility is necessary to get a job, to support our family, and in many circumstances to, to go through and work a job. So there is um, a sponsorship of a bill that is uh, before, and I believe it's being heard next week, and was asked to bring that back and if there's any consideration for support for Minnehaha County. Questions, comments? I think, I think what we're being asked is if we would just be willing to sign as, a, as being in support of this bill. Wouldn't that have to come as a resolution? Okay. We think it could be in the form of just a letter, and that's, I think, really all they're asking for is, is just a letter in support, and there's some timing issues. That's why it's being brought today in this format. A letter drafted, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Dee. A letter drafted by um, Carol for us to sign if we wish to sign it. Is that the thought process? I'm, I'm confused as what, what we're doing. Well, I, I, I will just throw out initial thoughts on this and that would be that I draft a letter up that for the chairperson to sign that would acknowledge that the commission discussed this at today's commission meeting and uh, recognizes the value of it and would support this bill. If that 
you can also give me other direction. Really, this was just an opportunity because this came up yesterday for us to have an opportunity to visit about it a little bit. I know it's a little um, unorthodox, not the way we would typically um, bring something like this forward, but it is something that is um, we're b being asked by um, folks that are, are pushing this bill forward if we would be willing to indicate whether we are in support of this or not. Commissioner Karski. I, I guess I would prefer that instead of just one signature yours that we all have the opportunity to sign it if we wish. That, that would be my preference, so. Um, so is that a me uh, motion, Mr. Karski? I don't Karski? think we can make a motion. No. no. I'm cool with the letter that we could all sign. Um, so the state's attorney's office thinks that if we're gonna do that where we all sign the letter that we need a formal resolution next week, which we can certainly do. I'm not opposed to doing that. Um, I, I think that they were hoping to get some indication and perhaps all we can do is, is tell them that, you know, this was brought forward, kind of new to us. While um, we were generally um, interested in learning more, there wasn't a lot of, I'm not hearing a lot of opposition, but it might be just because we're, it's so new to everybody that we will, we'd be willing to um, consider it further and bring a resolution forward next week. I'm fine with that. Commissioner Heiberger. I just, I, I think that we should support this. Um, when you have a new immigrant, you think of when our ancestors immigrated, <coughs> excuse me, they probably didn't speak English, but by the second or the third generation, their families were fluent in, in English. And I, I think you're looking at people who are coming here and their parents are struggling to learn English. Um, and I just got back from Mexico and trying to converse with somebody who speaks minimal English and trying to encourage them to learn English. And I'm thinking, I can't even hardly say bathroom. So, um, or hello. Um, and, and it is a challenge for them. And I think that this is putting parents, legal immigrants, an opportunity to go to a job, an opportunity to pick their kids up at school, an opportunity to be safe on the road because we know who they are. Um, and this is only the written part of it. They still have to take the driver's test in talking, you know, speaking English. They go down this road with, on a, with, with, with a, a staff person, um, and they have to still complete the driver's test in person um, in English. And so this is only the written part. So. Commissioner Barth. I would say that uh, barring this opportunity, uh, people are going to be driving anyway. I'd rather have them have a driver's license, which at least lets you potentially have a sanction against bad behavior or driving. And, and I would say that there's probably uh, plenty of South Dakotans that are not literate enough to take the test in English. And I think that that is the why it was drafted this way, is recognition that people become more proficient in verbal skills in a language before, generally before they become proficient in the written skills. And I, I know I was visiting with somebody this morning where they um, ended up waiting a long time at the driver's license facility while somebody tried to help somebody who was not proficient in the written part get all the way through and complete the exam. Um, and then they did go out and take the driver's test and, and did not pass. So, I mean, there certainly are some checks and balances in the way the bill is drafted. It's, I think, a definite workforce issue. A lot of employers are supporting this because they are struggling to get um, workers, get workers to work, get workers that can drive company vehicles. And so um, I personally think that it makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's something that they have been working on, you know, for a while. But I'm I'm not opposed to doing this in a little more standard way, where we all have an opportunity to think about it and then to um, weigh in on a resolution next week. Madam Chair, another point I might make is that uh, Commissioner Karski and I are on the Intergovernmental Board, which meets at the Multicultural Center, and uh, in discussing a similar issue, uh, they talked about using interpreters taking the test and uh, I think it was like 200 bucks for someone speaking Spanish and 800 bucks for someone speaking Russian and uh, you know it's extortion almost at that on that basis. <coughs> Anything Do you remember further? that Dean? Do you remember <coughs> that discussion? Yeah. yeah. All right any further discussion on this? Okay.
just so I am on the same page, so no direction today other than we will prepare a resolution per your interest. I think we could probably communicate that, that will be before you next week for each of you to sign. A resolution for us to pass. A resolution would, to pass. Yeah, that would allow yes. us to sign a letter. Okay. Commissioner Heiberger. They can watch the video if they want and see where they think the votes will fall. Okay, thank you. They can listen to it, they but can they can't watch it because it. it's not on CityLink today. <laughs> it, will be, it will be on um, the internet, and we will be able to replay this. Okay, thank you. Nice. <clears throat> All right, so that's it for the legislative update. And that takes us to liaison reports. Are there any liaison reports today? Commissioner Barth. <laughs> Last night we had our planning and zoning meeting and it was uh, the shortest meeting that I've ever had in all these years. Um, there were just uh, four items on there and no one spoke on any of them. Uh, at the same time we elected uh, Bonnie Duffy to continue as chair and Becky Randall to continue as vice chair of our planning commission. And the, uh, uh, the commissioners that we re-elected all thanked us for uh, for uh, keeping them on, on, the, on the board. Oh, and tonight, Scott's not here. Tonight in, in uh, Hartford, there's a meeting with the city discussing uh, joint jurisdiction. Okay. That's at the Legion there, a block and a half north of the brewery. Commissioner Heiberger. I, I did get one phone call on that or text message asking if I could come, which obviously I can't because I'm in peer and I just commented too that you know I didn't know if any commissioners could be available but they were hoping so I'm glad you brought it up because I would have forgot thank you and there's Scott now you couldn't hear me could you Scott uh, oh I was talking about the meeting tonight in, in yes. Hartford and I also talked about re-electing re our officers uh, for the Planning Commission yeah, I, and I just wanted to remind the commission and I guess uh, anyone that's listening that we have the meeting tonight at Hartford at the joint zoning uh, discussion, joint zoning control with the city of Hartford. That's at 7 p.m. at the American Legion Hall, which is on Main Street. So if you have any questions, call me. Scott describes it as across the street from City Hall. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And thank you for your work you do on the planning commission that has been... <coughs> um, You've been a really valuable voice for us on that, and we thank really you. appreciate it. And we thanks to all the folks that serve on that, because that is, that, is um, that is a real public service, <laughs> is what that is, so thank you. All right, any other liaison reports? Okay, new business. Go ahead. Morning, Commission. Chris Lilly, Equalization. Um, I just wanted to come in and give you a heads up. Uh, our year for Equalization Office is wrapping up. Um, this is our busy peak time. Um, so with that, I just wanted to reiterate for the Commission and for the public that our assessment notices for your 2020 values for taxes due and payable in 2021 are required to be postmarked by law by March 1st. I'm right now targeting to try and have those out by March 20, or fe excuse me, February 21st. That's my target date. Um, just to give us a little buffer in between um, when they hit the mail and when we start getting phone calls. Um, with the tax notices going out right now, they're, they're a little behind, and, and our office has been buzzing yesterday. I mean, I think every phone was off the hook dealing with these calls. So I don't want that to happen with assessment notices and the short window between appeal times that we mail them out on, on the 1st, and all of a sudden here we are the next week. We're in appeals, and we haven't had any time to, to meet with, with folks to discuss their, their concerns or issues. Um, so again, with that, though, um, March 1st is a deadline for us to have the, the um, assessment notices out. Um, Thursday, March 12th, um, is the deadline to accept an appeal. So notices out March 1st. You have until the 12th to file a formal appeal with your local township or city. Um, and then the boards of equalization will meet March 16th through March 20th. Um, hopefully we'll have a light year. I don't know. We've had a lot of changes this year, a lot of restructuring and neighborhooding, um, a lot of conversion from an old system into a new system. Um, but the end result is our goal is to target market values. So regardless of the platform that we use to get to the value, we already know the target of where we need to reach to. So regardless of the mechanics of how we get there, our our finish line, if you will, is market value. So 
Um, hopefully we'll be a little more clear and concise this year and a little more accurate with our assessments. Um, it's not totally finished project yet, but we're, it's a work in progress. And by next year, hopefully we'll have the bulk of that. So the main point of me coming here was just to let the public know uh, March 1st assessment notice is out. And again, that is for your 2020 assessment for taxes due and payable in 2021. Right now we're getting a lot of calls of people that got their tax notice. Taxes are too high. Um, what's going on? We, you know, this is not the time to appeal. You cannot appeal your taxes. Only your value. So again, when your values come out, you're going to be paying taxes against this value in 2021. So this is your appeal time if you think your value is too high. So, Madam Chair, Commissioner Barry, people don't understand the difference between taxes and value. Um, and just on the notice, is there any indication on the notice if you've got the uh, owner-occupied exemption? Yeah. Yes. Um, as of last year, it had never been on the on the assessment notice prior um, until last year when I came on board and I got a glimpse of the assessment notice and I couldn't believe it wasn't on there. So we made that change. Um, on your property class, it will say um, the designation to be owner occupied for that reduction in the school levy is an S. So again, a, a little education. If it's just letters in your classification, and I don't even think our assessment notices here say that yet. It just says ag land, non-ag land, ag building, non-ag building. It doesn't give you a breakout as to the individual classes on those on the AS400. Um, notice, but it will say if your property is currently owner occupied, and that is a very good point. So the owner occupied, in order to qualify for that reduction in the school portion of the levy, you had to own your home, had to occupy your home, had to be a principal residence, and you can only have one. That all had to occur by November 1st of 2019. If you purchased your home in December, you're not eligible for the owner occupied for 20 pay 21 unless it was a continuing owner occupied, meaning the house was already owner occupied by the previous tenant on November 1 and you purchased that and on your certificate of value indicates that the house was and it will continue to be. In that case, there's no application required. We take care of that automatically in the office. However, if you bought your house in October and you have not made application for owner occupied, your assessment notice goes out March 1st, will indicate if you are or it won't indicate if you're not. It will say if you are. It doesn't say you are not owner occupied. It says if you are. If it doesn't say you're owner occupied and you meet the criteria of you owned it, you occupied it, it was your principal residence, you only want to claim one by November 1st, you have until March 15th to make application. So that's the reason why the staggering in the assessment notice requirement and the deadline. It's the, the last straw of here you go, here's your paper. It doesn't say you're owner occupied, you've got another two weeks to make that application. Those applications then we have to bring before the county board in April to get approved, but once we receive that and we verify that, it will be taken care of. So our office also has been mailing out. I don't know if they've sent quite yet. Um, they were working on, I, we've got a lot, a lot. We've screened through the system to find out anybody that's purchased a home that potentially could be owner-occupied that is not currently coded as being owner-occupied. We're mailing out those applications. And again, that's a... That's just a courtesy from our office. We are not required to do that by any statute or law. Um, I've always done that where I came from. Um, we're trying to do that, and, and they're, they're doing that now. And I, I think there's like 1,700 letters that we're mailing out that comes out of my budget for postage that we're not even required to do, but trying to get everybody that potentially could qualify to be qualified. Great. So pay attention to your mail. Don't throw your assessment notice away. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's an important document. You know, next year when you get your tax bill, if you think your taxes are too high and you want to call me to complain because your value now is too high, that Brit or that ship has sailed. There's nothing I can do. There's no appeal process for that. This is your time to state your reasons if you are aggrieved by the assessment that we think your value is. Any questions? We really appreciate you coming today and, and bringing forward that. I mean, everything that we can do to try to notify people of, of their rights and how this admittedly somewhat confusing system works mm -hmm. um, is I think worth time and worth the effort. So we really appreciate it. We really appreciate you sending out all those notices to folks that uh, may qualify for owner occupied because that's a valuable right that they should take advantage of as if a, they're as eligible. A, as a prime example, I just had a phone call this morning before I even had my computer on. A gentleman got a letter of denial. 
and, it, and, and that's just a formal letter. Anytime we remove owner-occupied, we have to notify the, the property owner that we're taking that owner-occupied classification off. And he was said, I just bought this other house. I want it on that house, and I don't want it on the one I'm going to be selling that one. And I looked in the system. I said, again, miscommunication of a letter. He got a letter stating, we're going to take it off of this one. And if you'd have read the whole, bo whole letter, it says, because you've applied on this one, so we're, we're putting your owner-occupied on this house, we're notifying you we're taking it off of this one. So after he got that and we clarified that, he's like, perfect, that's exactly what I wanted, so. Commissioner Heiberger. I only got one text message um, about, you know, what was going on with when the tax notices came out and that was a, a surprise that the school districts are getting at least 50% of my taxes. I said, that's what it, you know, so it's nice that there's that bro breakdown on there now. You can look at it and you can say, well, the county's getting this, the cities are getting this, and, and, and the school districts are getting this. But and I, I'm, I'm going to throw one other caveat out to the county here. Um, moving forward onto the ENCODE tax software with the auditors completing their tax notices out of ENCODE this year, whether you realize it or not, that has been a good move. I know there's grumblings of the software and things like that. But with the AS400, what it came out of, we weren't able to do anything. As, as of yesterday, when we started getting all these calls on taxes, I put in a request to IT to load ENCODE on, on some key people in my office because we can look in, the, in that ENCODE tax system then and say, yep, here's your taxes. Here's your taxes for your house. Here's your taxes for your ag buildings. Here's your taxes for your land. And oh, by the way, this percentage or this dollar amount went to the county, this dollar amount went to the school, this dollar amount went to the street maintenance, this dollar amount went to drainage fees. We weren't able to visualize all of that on, on the AS400. So the software in and of itself is going to be a lifesaver for answering those, those public questions when they call. So. All right. Madam Chair. Commissioner Barth. I was standing next to you at the counter and uh, a fellow came in that he understood his taxes, but he wanted to know what it was being spent on. That's not your, that's not your department no, that decides not. where the school's spending it or whatever. But people come in and they're all, all confused about all of this. And the more communication we do on this, I think the better off we are. And and maybe we need you to come back a couple times uh, before we start getting those. Uh, appeals and stuff and, and talk about the process and the difference between valuation and taxes. I mean, that's, you're raising my taxes. No, we're raising your valuation. It's not the same thing. When we get our market analysis done and, and I kind of get some ideas as to where we're going, I mean, we just, my audit, we're just completing that this week, um, started last week and this week. Um, so we're at the point now where we can really start analyzing and we're kind of under the gun here now to get all the analysis done of what we need to do to our current values to match them to market. Do we need to go up? Do we need to go down in some areas? Um, do we need to stay the same, no change? That's what we're working on. When I get all of that kind of put together with my intentions that I have to submit to peer of, this is where I was, this is where I'm going, this is why I'm going there, um, I'll probably come down and give a brief and an overview kind of on a neighborhood by neighborhood um, as to what to expect the assessment notices to reflect. All right. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. We appreciate you. your time to be here. So that takes us to old business. Is there any old business? If not, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everyone, for coming.